Uh, she is, yes. Okay. Uh, so it's, um, you know, it, 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 it's a thing about irony. What I notice, when, when Americans say something ironic, they always say, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, if you do that, you're no longer being ironic. Right. It ruins the whole thing. Um, but sometimes uh, people will say to me, well, what did you have to do uh, in the audition mm -hmm. to get the role of Pinhead? What, what was the audition like? Now, the, the truth is there was no audition. Yeah. Because people who know any of my backstory know that uh, Clive Marker and I were at the same high school in Liverpool. And we met uh, working in, in the, on the school play together uh, somewhere around about 1969, and then I had spent um, uh, over 10 years working in the theatre with Clive. We had our own theatre company. Uh, Clive doing most of the act, uh, writing, he was acting early on, and then he stopped to concentrate on directing and writing, and I was like the, the main actor in the company. So the truth is, he just asked me. That's it, there was no audition. He said, do you want to do this? And I said, yes. yes. That was it. But I, I've occasionally said to people, um, well, they put me, they put me in a room, uh, just with a with a camera and a table, and on the table there was a pile of nails and a hammer, <laughs> and they told me to get creative. <laughs> um, and, and you'd be amazed how many times people people go, oh. <laughs> they believe you. They think that's what happened. Um, so I have to say, no, 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 hold on. That's, I'm just, just kidding. kidding. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. All right, do we have any audience questions in the moment? Yes, sir. Okay, well, um, Pinhead is very famously like an intellectual, kind of contemplative villain. And in the interviews I've seen with you, and even right here today, you seem to share that characteristic. Right? The intellectual part, not the villain part. <laughs> but, okay. so how much of you know me? That's true, that's right. So how, how much of you went into that, or how, what are the challenges of playing an intellectual villain? Do you enjoy playing an intellectual villain as opposed to some other kind of villain? Um, wow, that's a lot, a lot of bits going on with that question, I think. Um, the intellectual villain element of it is Clive. I, you know, and people who are familiar with Clive's writing know that Clive is never going to be satisfied with just a villain. That's boring. And it's generally true, I think. In, in the same way that the only interesting heroes are flawed heroes. They're, they're just, if a hero is just heroic all the time, Kind of dull. But, you know, I, I, I think it's a bit of, bit of a difference between Superman and Batman, for example, for me. Ultimately, I found Superman a little bit dull because he's just, you know, he's great, he's Superman. Uh, you know, no argument with that. But he's just heroic all the time. You know, so, okay. That's, but Batman is, you know, Batman's fucked up. So. <laughs> <laughs> You, you do what? You dress, why do you dress up as a bat? What's that about? What's going on? I mean, that's being explored now in the movies. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's weird. Therefore, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, and if a villain is just a villain, is a villain, is a villain, is a villain, again, they're boring. Give them a sense of humor. Give them a sense of playfulness. Um, then they become interesting, uh, I think. Um, uh, I don't know about me being intellectual, I'm not, you know, uh, I guess, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Um, uh, but so, so that element goes, goes in, but all the cues are taken from the screenplay. And, and the first thing that I noticed really with the screenplay was, again, people who are familiar with Clive's work know that his style is naturally um, uh, a high style, poetic style, um, and I and I was very familiar with that because I've been very up close to to all of Clive's writing up to the point of uh, uh, Hellraiser. 
I was very conscious that he was writing down in kind of movie ease in, in the screenplay. And then Pinhead turns up and everything changes. Uh, and it, it, to me it felt like Clive had gone, <sighs> thank God, I can let the handbrake off and I can go now. Um, so the nature of Pinhead's language is markedly different from the way that anybody else uh, in the screenplay is, is speaking. So that stands out. Um, and, you know, and I will, I'll go to irony again. And the, the, first, the first line I really got a hold of uh, and kind of underlined in, in, in my script and I wrote next to it, gag, exclamation mark, which was a note to me to say, this is supposed to be funny. And I should be making people laugh, but it should be uneasy laughter. And that line was, no tears please, it's a waste of good suffering. Yes. And I thought, I'm not doing that right if people don't find it funny, but they kind of, at the same time, should be thinking, yeah. <laughs> okay. um, uh, so uh, that element is, 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 is built in. As an actor, it's great to have that kind of stuff to play with. I've always said that, you know, Pin, Pinhead's a, uh, he's a, he's a monster in a, in, a, in a horror film, shorthand, we could talk about that, because he isn't really, but, um, uh, uh, you know, who wouldn't be in a lot if he found himself at a garden party with Noel Coward and Oscar Wilde, you know, and Groucho Marx. He'd be able to hold his own with them quite happily. You know? um, and somewhere they're all on the same page, uh, I think. But at the end of the day, there's hooks and chains and a degree of soul ripping that, you know, you're not going to escape from. So we can enjoy all the pleasantries, but you know, at the end of it, you're toast. <laughs> generally speaking. Um, so the rest of it, I don't know. I mean, it's you know, it. Uh, I don't know how all that happens. Uh, all the normal questions you would ask yourself as an actor don't apply. You know, um, uh, what, what, what car does my character drive? Where does he bank? Does he prefer baseball over American football, or both equally? Or you know, is, or is he not into sports at all? Or does he read? You know, <laughs> none of these questions apply to him. Um, uh, and as far as I was aware, there was nowhere I could go to watch Cenobites at work. You know, um, I hope not. Anyway. Uh, um, so all you can do is read the screenplay and talk to Clive who would literally drank the character up. Um, and the rest is your imagination. Uh, you know, they say we put part of ourselves into every part we play and we take a little bit of every character we play. God help me. Um, uh, away with us. Um, uh, but Otherwise, I, I don't know. I don't know. You stand on your marks, somebody says action, and you flip a switch in your head and hope for the best. And it's all we can say, really. Hello. Yes, you can. Hello. 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 He doesn't do a lot of killing, or he didn't early on. In Hellraiser, who does he kill? Frank? Uh, yeah, that's it. In the first movie, am I missing something? Julia. Julia does the killing. Yeah. I know. I, um, I, I don't kill Julia. Uh, I, I, I didn't kill her. Did I? Frank Yeah. Yes. yes. And she gets resurrected. Right. Who, do, who do I kill in Hellbound? I don't think I kill anyone in no. Hellbound, do I? Not sure that I do. 
Hell is a three, I wiped out an entire <laughs> nightclub. I'll take that. Kane Holler likes to play this game with me, because Kane Holler keeps a count of his kills. Yes. Strange man. Um, you know, and he, and he, he liked to tease me, you know, that Pinhead was a bit of a win, because, you know, he doesn't really kill many people, and, you know, I would just say, said to him, uh, uh, how many people can you fit in an average nightclub on a Saturday night? 300? 500? Gone in a heartbeat. Match that, Jason. <laughs> well, you know, we interviewed Kane yesterday. Yeah. And he, he changed his word and he's like, you know, unless it was like all at once. Ah. Uh, he did. He started to so I just said, now I know. I got under his skin. That came from you. Yeah. 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 Um, so, but he, but he does, it goes back in a way to what I was saying before, which was. Uh, my shorthand in my own head approaching Hellraiser was because I was a fan of horror movies as a teenager. Um, before I knew I was I was going to be an actor, um, was I'm going to play the monster in a horror film? How cool is that? Uh, but he isn't really. He's an impartial judge. He's, he's an umpire. He, uh, the monsters in the movie, again, this is, this is quintessential Clive Barker. Uh, Nightbreed is exactly the same idea. Uh, in, in Nightbreed, the breed are not the monsters. The humans are the monsters. The breed want to be left alone to be freaks. End of story. But, you know, of course that's not gonna work. Uh, and in Hellraiser, Frank and Julia are the monsters. Um, it's Julia who's, as I said, you know, it's Junior who's out trolling the bars, bringing business businessmen home and beating their brains out with a hammer to feed their blood to yeah. to Frank. Yeah, we covered Hellraiser on our podcast, The Dolphin Horror, just a couple of weeks ago, um, and uh, we talked a lot about Julia in her character's progression yeah. and what a wonderful artist. Claire Higgins is. Brilliant performance. Right, brilliant. And brilliant. is there anything about I screen tested her? Like I screen tested the screen test and I, I looked her in the eyes and I thought, you don't need to screen test this girl. She's there. Yeah. She's in the moment. Yeah. And she was. Brilliant performance. Right, yeah. She's a, she's a very, very, very talented actress. Right. And our guest on Hellraiser that episode was Jessica Lange. Yeah. And she was just talking about how Like new emotions come up, and he's been watching it since it came out. You know, right. um, Alex also used to compete in leather man conventions. You know, he was Mr. Long Beach Leather, and so we titled the episode "Is Your Le Your Leather Daddy" because of your costume. I'm your leather. Exactly. So there's that. All right. Yes. I have a question over here. Yes. Um, so. Uh, Yes, but it's been done, unfortunately. Um, the, the, the other character that I really, really wanted to play was Harry the Moor. Uh, but Scott Bakula got that game. Yeah. Um, uh, and um, I, I, I can't remember. The, uh, Shantwell, I think, in We World. Uh, it was very much a favorite as well. I'll settle for old Penny. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? So, when did you personally kind of take it in that you were a horror icon, and how do you feel about it today? <sighs> uh, it, you, you know, it, it, it doesn't make any sense to me because I I know I know who horror icons are. As I said, I'm a, I, 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 I was a fan of, of horror movies, 
I know the FBI. Like there are some monsters. And sure, I, I know the FBI comic business. Well, my icons are Lon Chaney Senior uh, and Boris Karloff and Peter Cushing. I'll take those three. If I have to take three, it will be those three. And Peter Cushing is my god. Um, uh, amongst horror movie, horror movie actors. And he's one of the best actors who ever drew breath, in my opinion, even uh, outside the genre as well. Um, even before I, 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 I got to know him in the, in the Hammer movies, he played uh, Sherlock Holmes for the BBC in the 1960s. He was my first Sherlock Holmes. He was, he was winning awards in the 1950s, uh, for, in particular for a a live television broadcast of the dramatization of uh, George Orwell's 1984. Uh, and for me, what marks Cushing is that ability to play that, that, that white, hot, pure intensity um, that he brings to Van Helsing in the Dracula movies for Hammer. <clears throat> and then he switches to playing Baron Frankenstein in Hammer's Frankenstein series, which is the, 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 the only series of Frankenstein movies in which the Baron, Cushing is so brilliant that the Baron becomes the focus, not the creature. And those, those, those run, I've, I've said, I, I think that, that run of Frank and Hammer Frankenstein movies, Peter Cushing's performance, which gets more and more amoral, and I stress the word amoral as opposed to immoral, as the series goes on, is, is the greatest essay in evil put on screen. Um, brilliant, brilliant actor. <clears throat> to put me in the same bracket as those people, to me, is ridiculous and ludicrous and nonsense. But it keeps happening, and I, I accept I have to accept that, you know, uh, I, I made my mark indelibly in the history of horror movies. And it's, it's a humbling honor for me to know that that is the case. It is the case. So I have to accept it. I don't, you know, I don't generally wake up in the morning and think, hey, I'm a horror icon. <laughs> um, you know, I get up and go about my business. It's for other people to decide, but enough people have now told me that it is the case that I have to eventually accept. That's um, a fact. It, it seems to be, yeah. <laughs> for this generation, for my generation, but also like for the, the new ones, right? Well, and, you know, there's a new generation, younger and younger, yeah. finding the movie all the time, and the thing seems to be as fresh as a daisy. It is, uh, it holds up. To, to new people finding it, mm -hmm. um, you know. Um, and I'm always eager when, when um, I know people have just seen the movie for the first time to, to ask them, you know, how it was. And the response is always enthusiastic. Um, and nobody's ever said to me yet, well, yeah, you know, for a movie made in the, in the 1980s, you know, yeah, it, you know, I guess yeah. it's okay. It's you know, okay for the 80s. But it doesn't, I mean, apart from, you know, um, shoulder pads and, 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 and Claire's hair yeah. and, uh, puts us firmly in, in, in the late 1980s. Um, the movie hasn't aged. Right. And the Cenobites never will. Right. Um, I've always said you could, show, you could show an image of the Cenobites to a 14th century monk mm -hmm. and he'd know exactly what he was looking at. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if, you know, it looks increasingly unlikely, but if any of us are still around in 400 years time. Um, uh, you know, those, those images will remain as strong and as powerful as ever. Uh, and it's, that's the genius of what Clive did in Hell is for me, was he, he takes uh, a, what, what was, what was the, the, the kind of Duriger format at the time, which is a slasher movie. You take the Cenobites out of that story and it still works as a straightforward, slightly dull, but perfectly serviceable um, contemporary slasher movie. Because everything else is still in place. Like Frank and Julia and, and, and Larry and, and, and Kirsty and, and 
bringing Frank back to life, which has nothing to do with the Cenobites, you know. He's, you find another reason why he's dead under the floorboards and married Greeks and brings him back to life and everything else follows from there. Um, and what Pi then does is he, he, he comes and he drops pure Gothic horror bomb into the middle of that contemporary slasher movie, which is the Cenobites. Um, and everything changes. Well, was it like putting um, Elliot in part three out of makeup um, and, and doing the character before he turned into? Yeah, uh, first in first in Hellbound. Yeah, uh, and then in, you in, really got to flush it out. In, in Hell, absolutely right. Uh, well, you know that again. That's an opportunity that is not going to come along uh, uh, very often, if at all, in the master's career. It was great. I I I I, I love the challenge, uh, especially you know the weird challenge of playing opposite myself. Yeah. Um, uh, I especially liked sitting down in the makeup chair, you know, a bit of powder, you know, <laughs> this. Right. And after three minutes, five minutes, yeah. they say, yeah, you're good, <laughs> you can go, what? I don't have to sit here for the next four hours? Oh, it's great. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And they get to wear different clothes. Yes, I stand on a military uniform, but it was a strange moment because um, when we were approaching filming that, we were filming both sides of the scene mm -hmm. in the same light. Mm -hmm. So somebody had to dub me as Pinhead. We were doing doing me as Elliot first, and then halfway through the night, um, I went into in, into makeup and, and we did the, the same scene in the reverse. So there had been a very long line of people uh, trying to convince the first AD and the director that they should be the person playing um, Dublin me as Pinhead. You know? People who were a foot taller than me and a foot shorter than me <laughs> and a deal wider than me and a deal narrower than me. Um, uh, in the end, it was unsurprisingly, it was the guy who was my stand right. um, uh, who got the gig. But I, so I, I, I'd been to make up very briefly, very nice, gone to wardrobe got my military uniform on, which is very nice, makes you feel very good. And I walked onto set and there's a pinhead. I'd never, I'd never had that moment. I'd never seen pinhead disembodied, as it were, or, you know, without me in, in. You got in, to see him from other people's. You know, he was just standing there looking at me and it was a very weird moment and I didn't like it. Yeah. At all. <laughs> and I, it was at that point I realized how, uh, how possessive Get out of there! That's that's not that's not for you to play with. That's that's mine. Yes. Nice. My toy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Any more audience questions? Yeah. Kind of going along with what you had just said. Um, you had been pinhead for so long. You did such a great job at it. I'm assuming you watched the movie. If you have, what what is your idea? What's your take on the route? Hellraiser has taken with the new pinhead and how, how they're writing it now, as opposed to what you created in your vision when you first started out. Um, uh, well, uh, a, a lot of time had gone by, is the first thing. I mean, uh, uh, I, we, we, we shot Dada and Hellworld, which were the seventh and eighth movies, uh, back to back. Um, I think 2000, I think, I'm trying to remember now. No, no, 2002, I think, maybe. We shot, it gets harder to remember all these things in chronology. Um, uh, Inferno was 99 and Halsey was, two, I think, 2002. So, eight years have gone by, um, uh, and I was contacted about Revelation. Um, I was uncertain about it to begin with because, um, you know, it, it's a matter of record that the, the only reason Re Revelation got made was that uh, someone at Dimension Films had, had noticed that they were, if they didn't get a movie made, 
by a certain date, they were going to lose the rights to the franchise. And uh, I, was, I was being contacted in the middle of July for a movie that, was, that had to be in front of the cameras on September the 3rd. Um, uh, they weren't spending any money on it. Um, everything was happening in a terrible rush. It didn't seem to me like you know, a serious attempt to revitalize the franchise and move it forward. Um, uh, and I was not being offered very much money, but I've said before, you know, if working in the dog company with Clyde and the theater company taught me anything, it is that movie is a, is a very bad, money is a very bad reason to say no to things. It's a very good reason for saying yes to things you probably don't want to do. <laughs> um, uh, um, but, and so for that reason, I did say that I wanted to see the screenplay. Um, I read the screenplay and made my decision and I turned it down. Um, having read the screenplay, I didn't expect Revelation to be very good. I didn't expect it to be quite as bad as it was, I have to say in all honesty. I haven't seen Judgment. Again, I was approached about Judgment. Uh, negotiations um, broke down, uh, and so I passed on it. Um, and I've met uh, Paul Taylor, who, who followed me as Pinhead. That's all cool, you know. Um, uh, and I haven't seen the movie today, not because I'm trying to avoid it, I simply haven't got around to it. Yeah, wow. that was it. And now we have the remake, uh, finally, which has been threatened for forever and a day. Um, uh, and as far as I'm aware, it's done. Um, and they've gone a very interesting route with it, which is they have cast uh, Jamie Clayton, who is a transgender actress, to play Pinhead. Um, I think I think that's a perfectly valid uh, way to go. No reason not to. I do like to point out that I did wear a skirt. <laughs> um, uh, somebody at my table this weekend, and we were discussing this. <laughs> I want to own this line because I, I think I think I'm going to you know make it make it a dot com for myself. He just he said yeah. Badass in a skirt. <laughs> so I think uh, badassinaskirt.com, I think I, I mean, <laughs> um, uh, have to own that. But you know, it, but it, it's a casting call, it's no more than that. I know Jamie's work from there was a science fiction series on Netflix several years ago called Sense8, which I really liked. I'm disappointed it didn't go to a second season. She's in that, and I liked her work in that very much. I haven't seen stuff that she's done more recently. Um, it's a casting call. It's no it's a casting decision. It's, it's, it's no more than that. And okay, female pen, pen head. Well, what does that mean? What is female? You know, there are a, a million shades of femininity. Um, well, you know, we'll. We'll see. I've met, I've met the guy who played Chapter, who's like six foot nine. So, you know, uh, we'll see what happens. But I, um, I think that's coming out on Hulu, I guess, for Halloween. But it is done. Um, they offered me a cameo in it to uh, play the guy who, you know, the selling the box, what's your pleasure moment. But I've already done that. I played that role in Hellseeker, um, and uh, you know, it, 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 it was a decent, again, it, it wasn't about money because the, the offer was decent, and uh, I thought about it, and I just thought, you know, no, I don't think that feels right. You've got to start over and move on, start over and move on, so I thank them for offering it me and wished everybody well. And, um, Decline. We'll see what happens. Um. But no argument. Everyone wants to start a fight. You're not mad. Um. You're not mad at it. Like no hard feelings. You're like you know. No, it's good. Right. Yeah. Um. Like 
everyone always wants to start a fight, like, how do you feel about it? Like, aren't you mad? No. No. Right. What's the point? Right. What's the point? It's, you know, it's, it, it's beyond my control anyway. Um, and obviously, if they, if they want to cast a female pinhead, that kind of takes me out of the equation. <laughs> so that's right. end of discussion. Right. Okay. Um, the point is, you know, anybody can do whatever they like. I mean, we'll see how well this works. Will they do a sequel to the remake and so forth? You know, um, um, fine. It's, Hellraiser doesn't go away. Right. It's all still there, and yeah. that's that's fine. So yeah. all the movies exactly. stand. Was it fun playing Pinhead? Was it fun playing Pinhead? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yes, uh, but you can you can hide it kind of hear an asterisk of qualification <laughs> uh, along the back of it. But all movies are hard work, and all movies come with their difficulties, and all movies have their moments when you hate everybody. Um, uh, and there were moments, there were moments, very often at the end of the day, when my tired, haggard, horrible face would emerge out of this beautiful makeup where uh, I did have my moments where I'd be, I'd, I'd be staring at myself thinking, why me? Why me? There are a thousand actors who give their right arm to be sitting where I am right now. Why me? Um, and on the, on the subsequent movies, uh, on day one, Everything was great because I love being on a movie set, and you know, it's so I'm there again, it's going around saying hi to everybody and all of that. And then there comes the moment, you know, where the makeup artist is coughing behind you and saying, uh, <clears throat> "Don't we, uh, we really need to um, get started, you know, on the makeup?" Those would be the moments when I'd have to go to the bathroom or I'd have a, an urgent phone call to make or somebody I really needed to speak to. And I realized I was actually trying to delay the moment in my head. And then there were, and there were times on day one, I'd walk into the makeup trailer and there would be that face, <laughs> the, 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 the makeup sitting on a dummy head staring at me with the instruments of torture all laid out and the smell of the paint and the smell of the glue. <sighs> okay, here we go. Once I got day one out of the way, then it's fine. We're playing in the sand pit. You know, it, 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 acting is dressing up. Acting is make-believe. Acting is let's pretend, right? You do that. When you're playing with your with your with, with your friends in the streets, or when you're in school, or you know, dressing up for Halloween, it's what we do. We we mess around in the sandpit. We pretend to be people we're not. And in the case of Pinhead, I pretend to be somebody who never existed, without a name. And uh, it's a, it's it's a privilege, and it is a lot of fun. Yes. Yeah, it should be. Otherwise, you should, you know, find another job. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one more. Okay. Yeah, yes, sir. What is the, I took a question, though. What is the uh, most fun you've had on, uh, which Hellraiser entry you've had the most fun on? And also, is that you uh, playing Pinhead in the uh, USA up all night commercials from back in the day with uh, Gilbert Gottfried and Ron Cheer? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I played the pizza delivery guy. I did a few of those things. Yeah. Slightly reluctantly. Um, but it, you know, it was all publicity. It was all publicity um, for, particularly for the third film, I think. The fourth film. I did a lot of stuff. I was, I did, uh, I did, a, I did spring break for MTV in Panama City. It was like a, like a talent costume. Uh, and the failures were sent over to me. I had a big fake cauldron that I was supposed to be staring and staring and putting people in. I, 
I'm standing there on the stage looking at all this and looking, looking at an endless sea of bombs down the beach by the place. There are worse things to be looking at, God knows. Um, you did a criminal game of right? <laughs> thinking to myself, what the hell am I doing here? It's David Spain. Yeah. Uh, and that was a cool moment. Um, that was the MTV Video Awards yeah. when they used to do the thing where celebrities weren't on the list and they couldn't get in and, and David Spader had the list. And that year, the, the people who couldn't get into the MTV Video Awards were Roseanne, Andrew Dice Clay, Pinhead and Ringo. <laughs> uh, and so I rolled up already in makeup and costume, we'd done that in the hotel, and then I got into a limo. That song, because we, we, we left my room in the hotel, <laughs> we got into the elevator to go down to the ground floor. Halfway down, the elevator doors open, and, and here's a regular businessman with his attaché case <laughs> waiting to get into the elevator. The elevator doors open, and he finds himself face to face with him. <laughs> and I didn't say a word, he just stood up and he just went. <laughs> And I always imagine him going home at the end of the day, you know, to his family, saying, hey kids, <laughs> guess, guess who I met in the elevator. Um, and there was a game I used to play in the, in, in the limo when I was traveling in, in makeup and costume, which was coming up to a stoplight and being aware that another car would come up and stop alongside me. And then I, I could just let the window down. <laughs> <laughs> and wait for them to make eye contact with me, you know, and then just, and then zzz, back up and, and, and if I timed it right, then the light would change and we'd be away. And we'd be <laughs> uh, but we arrived, um, and you know, I should backstory this by saying that I was born in Liverpool, um, and I was like seven. Eight, just becoming aware that this thing called pop music existed when Love Me Do hit the charts. Um, and my city was about to become the epicenter of this whole thing. Um, I, I am one of the world's biggest Beatles fan yeah. from day one forward and still am. They're still the greatest band of all time. Um, uh, so I, the, we are, we are, it was like UCLA. Um, uh, and uh, I got out of the limo, uh, PA girls you know, came over and said, we're, we're delighted to have you here, we'll just bring you over to the stadium area. Um, uh, uh, Eric Clapton and Elton John are rehearsing right now. Uh, oh, and Ringo's here. Uh, and I, I walked down and I turned, and um, Ringo was talking to two guys and had his back to me. Uh, and, and one of the guys said something, and Ringo turned around and he, he looked at me and, he's, and he, he said, Hey, it's Pinhead. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, my legs had gone, completely gone to jail. Completely gone to jail. Um, and found sometimes at the table, at my table at these conventions, you know, they, they would say to me, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm babbling, because I, I, I can't cope with the fact that I'm talking to you. I reference that moment, because believe me, I babbled, insanely and inanely, um, to Ringo, who was you know, great about But I'm sure I said lots of extremely embarrassing things, like, I'm from Liverpool too. <laughs> um, uh, and with the very greatest respect to Mr. Saki, that was just Ringo. You know, if I had been in front of Paul or God forbid John, if it had been if it had been Lennon, I would have run away. I don't think I could have coped. I don't think I could have coped. I couldn't have said a word to him. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, there was lots of those. I mean, I was on Arsenio. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, you're trying to get rid of me now. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> if we didn't get two of your questions, please go to his table. I'm not here for today. All right, he's here for the rest of the day, guys. So go see him.